reishi as an immune tonic, you can take it long term and it won't cause an overactiveness or hyperactiveness in our immune system because of its qualities as an immunomodulator. So what that means is that it helps our immune system sort of meet whatever is coming its way. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I am thrilled to bring you this conversation with Asia Suler. I've been seeing Asia's powerful herbal and healing offerings out in the world for years now, and it was a delight to finally meet her and spend some time together. As you'll see, I just finished reading her book, Mirrors in the Earth, which I absolutely loved and I highly recommend. In this interview, Asia shares reishi through a beautiful lens. If you aren't already welcoming reishi into your life, her sharing will probably inspire you to do so. Asia is a writer, teacher, herbalist, and earth intuitive who lives in the folds of the Blue Ridge Mountains. She is the founder of One Willow Apothecaries, an Appalachian-grown company that offers handcrafted herbal medicines and educational experiences in herbalism, animism, ancestral healing, and earth-centered personal growth. Asia has guided over 20,000 students in 70-plus countries through her immersive online programs. With her writings and teachings, Asia helps people embrace their own unique medicine, through a joyful engagement with the natural world. Asia's first book, Mirrors in the Earth, Reflections on Self-Healing from the Living World, is available now. Welcome to the podcast, Asia. Oh, Rosalie, thank you so much for having me here. It's an honor. Oh, it's my pleasure to have you here. And I'm very happy to finally meet you after all of these years of following your work and and getting to know you through the online world. So thank you for taking the time to be here with us. Yeah, well, I feel very much the same. Hmm. Well, I'd love to start where we always begin, which is hearing your plant path, your plant story, and all that has come to bring you here with us today. So I love hearing people's stories. So I'm so glad you always ask this question, and I'm happy to share my story. Uh, When I was in my late teens, I was diagnosed with a chronic pain condition of the pelvic bowl called vulvodynia. And, you know, at the time, what I like to say is that the, the world inside my body was so uncomfortable, it pushed me outside. So I was in college at the time, and anyone who's ever dealt with any kind of chronic pain condition, chronic illness, knows this experience of, of often feeling invisible, like, what you're dealing with is just not seen or recognized by the people you're around. And, you know, especially being in college, I felt like I was having a very different experience than a lot of the people around me. And yet when I went out into the woods and when I sat with the trees and and the herbs and, and lounged by the Creek, I felt seen, I felt held and I felt hope. And so I, I started going out and being with nature because I didn't know what else to do. And and it was my solace. It was my safe space. And, you know, especially when I was told that this would probably be pain I'd live with for the rest of my life. And there was really nothing I could do besides get surgery to remove nerve endings from my body. And it was really through being with the plants that I started to feel and have this sense that there was another way to go about things that maybe this Western medical model wasn't the only model out there, that there was other possibilities for me and healing. And this was before I knew any plant names or could really ID any plants at all. I made up my own names. 
<laughs> for plants and trees. Like I recognize them, but I, as like individuals, but um, I didn't know their names, you know? And so it was really, for me, it really began from this sort of heart to heart, um, emotional and spiritual level of connecting with the plants. And, and I was eventually able to actually heal from this chronic pain condition through a variety of alternative modalities, but it was really through connecting with the plants that I, I saw that possibility and that hope, you know, I could see the way in which even when a, a tree fell, that that wasn't the end of the life in that part of the forest, that new flowers came forth, new saplings could spring up. And I thought, well, if nature can heal anything, then then so can I. And so I, I ended up after college moving to New York City. And I, I was like, I just want any job I can get that's working with plants. <laughs> Mm. And so I got the only job I could find, which was working as a plant technician, which is a fancy name for someone who waters office plants. So I had like my giant duffel on the subway with my watering can. And I went from, you know, Midtown to Times Square to the financial district. And I watered plants in, in these office buildings. But, you know, it was it was sort of my, my tether, my connection to these these plants and and to the green and living world. And one morning, you know, I woke up early for this job. One morning I woke up before I did the commute and I just had this thought in my head, which was, I want to go to school to be an herbalist. And looking back now, I realized that like, I think I thought I knew what that was, was like being an herbalist, but I really mm -hmm. had no idea. It was just like this idea that fell out of nowhere. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that I'm going to do that. And so I ended up interviewing through herbal schools and moved down to the mountains of Western North Carolina in the Blue Ridge, where I now live, to go to the Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine. And I still remember that first day it was so clearly. Like we had a potluck lunch, and I was sitting at the potluck lunch, and it slowly dawned on me that I was like, oh my gosh, I know nothing. <laughs> you know, everyone was like, we went around and was like, what's your favorite plant? And, you know, oh, what, what tinctures have you made? And I was like, I don't even know what a tincture is. I've never even made a loose leaf tea before. I don't know how to do this. And so, um, yeah, it was it was humbling, but also amazing to look back because for me, I was just passionate about the plants. I just, I wanted to get to know them. I wanted to have these relationships. I wanted to learn about them. I wanted to be, to have them in my life and to be in their lives. And so, you know, even though it was humbling and hard, I, I still came at it from just this, place of passionate enthusiasm like you know i just i'm here to learn and that's still how i feel like i'm i'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a lifelong learner so you know that's that's how my my formal study of herbs began and after i graduated from school i ended up starting to see clients and um as a practitioner relationship and started in more of a sort of traditional clinical kind of setting uh, looking at whole health and then really eventually got more into you know m mentorship and really working with people on more of a emotional spiritual level with plants and um yeah started teaching and and so everything has kind of evolved from that that point but what, what's been really neat to witness is just the, the more i evolve and change and and get older, the more my relationship with the plants just continues to evolve and change and sort of inform each new new layer of my life and my experience. And, and each time I'm, I'm a new beginner in something, which is still all the time, uh, the plants are always there to hold me in that. Hmm. That's beautiful, Asia. I love some things that like stick out to me is one that you were called to the plants through your own healing process and just being outside and that connection and then I loved how you're just like, well, I'll be an herbalist. I'll go to herbal school. And <laughs> you didn't know a thing. I was the same way. Like the first class I ever took was on how to make oils. And the instructor started talking about plantain. And I had lived in the Dominican Republic. So I thought it was like, you know, like the fruit that you eat. You know, and I was like, and she was talking about it. And she, I was like, really plantain? And she's like, oh yeah, it grows in the driveway. And I was like, really? Wow. So I had that same thing of just like, I didn't know a thing. But I think it's so important to share that because sometimes people, I mean, I hear that you probably hear this too as a teacher. People think, oh, it's too late. I should have learned when I was younger, et cetera. But it's just like, there, we always start from, you know, this base level. And it really is passion and enthusiasm and the calling of the plants that keeps bringing us forth. Yeah, so much so. And I see this over and over again, that 
often for people there, there is some sort of call, you know, and it, and it can come out of a, a moment of real crises, you know, whether it's a, a loss or a health crisis or, um, you know, just being in a really hard place and feeling like your life is falling apart that like from that, that crux of that moment, there's this clarion call. And mm-hmm. it's, it's so beautiful to witness how I, I feel like this is nature calling us back home again and again and again. And the plants are, are really, they're messengers and they're gatekeepers mm-hmm. for us. And, and they're asking us to come back into relationships. So I just, I love hearing everyone's individual stories of how they've been called because it's, it's just such a special and precious thing. Mm, it is. Yes. Thank you. Well, Asia, you have chosen the first mushroom to be (laughs) on the podcast, which I am so excited for. And leading up to this, I was kind of like just laughing to myself about how um, there are some people out there who really want the definition of herbs to be like herbaceous plants that die back every year, like a very like, but for the herbalist, we're like plants, mushrooms, (laughs) whatever, (laughs) tree bark, it's all herbs to us, so... (laughs) I'm very excited that you've chosen reishi and I'm excited to hear maybe why you, you know, start with just why, why reishi spoke to you to speak about today. Yeah. Thank you for allowing me to talk about a mushroom <laughs> on the podcast. That was something I, I remember like realizing when I first started out in herbalism too, I'm like, Oh, it's all herbalism. <laughs> um, and so, yes. And I, and I thank reishi for letting me, letting me call them an, an herb. Uh, so mm-hmm. I chose reishi because this is a, a mushroom that I have a really profound relationship with and a deep relationship with. And, and I, I really only like talking about plants that I have a deep relationship with and that, that also, you know, feel to me like important for this time. And so, you know, there's a story I want to share in a little bit about, you know, why I feel like this mushroom in particular is really speaking to us right now and, and why it's like really come to the center of my practice and even my, my creativity practice, like where my inspiration is at. So, uh, you know, reishi, if anyone is, is not familiar with reishi, is a, a mushroom that has a very long history of use. So over 4,000 years, as much as we know of over 4,000 years of documented use in China and Japan. And in, in Chinese medicine, it's called lingzhi, which means spirit plant. And another name for, for reishi was mushroom of immortality. And when you start looking at the the health benefits of reishi, you can begin to see why this was such a prized medicine. So f- before it was cultivated, it was reserved for royalty, for, for the emperor. And then it, they figured out how to cultivate it and it sort of came available to, to the masses. But it was a highly prized medicine as something that helps nourish the chi and the blood. And now in, in the, the Western world, there's been a lot of studies with reishi. So we have sort of this interesting way in which so the two these two worlds can meet, sort of ancient knowledge and folkloric knowledge um, and, and highly practiced knowledge and, you know, Western clinical um, studies. And so here are the things that we know about reishi and its its medicinal uses in the body. And, and one of the reasons why it's so, you know, well known these days. So reishi is, it's considered both an immune tonic and an immunomodulator. And this is a pretty special combination. So immune tonic means that it's it's strengthening your natural immunity it's something you can take long term you know versus an herb that that might stimulate our immune system um, for the short term which is helpful something like echinacea with reishi as an immune tonic you can take it long term and it won't cause an overactiveness or hyperactiveness in our immune system because of its qualities as an immunomodulator so what that means is that it helps our immune system sort of meet whatever is coming its way. So for example, if you have an autoimmune condition, reishi can help your immune system modulate itself so that yes, you're increasing your innate immunity to outside pathogens, but you're you're not jacking up your immune system so that then it's triggering this autoimmune condition, which to me feels like such important medicine for the times because it it seems like almost all of us have some sort of variants of some sort of autoimmune stuff going on, you know, whether it's an actual autoimmune condition or whether it's just something like allergies that we, we have 
um, often these hyperactive immune system because of the environments that we've grown up in and, and what we've been exposed to. And so having a medicine that can help both increase our immunity and also help our immune system be really smart um, is, is really an invaluable thing. And, and reishi is also considered an adaptogen, which has gotten like a, adaptogens have gotten a, a really you know big reputation as like, take this adaptogen and you'll have endless energy. <laughs> But really, you know, adaptogens, they're, they're really about your body becoming more adaptable. So yes, it's about learning how to meet stress and not have it take down your system as much, but it's really about learning that, that flexibility. And we can see that within the immune system with reishi. So there's, there's that component of reishi. And a lot of the ways in which people also know of and work with reishi um, in in sort of the, a wider context or you know in more mainstream culture is knowing about reishi as as something that actually has um, cancer inhibiting properties as well as properties that help support people through chemotherapy. So it's become a popular remedy for folks who are dealing with cancer or moving through chemotherapy. And obviously that's a really important medicine for our times. Alongside that, in Chinese medicine, reishi was really prized for its interaction with our heart and our lungs. So in Chinese medicine, the heart and the lungs are, they're, they're a little bit more of a, of a combined system than we think of it in, in Western medicine. But so in this way of thinking and, and what we know of from sort of the, a medical perspective is that uh, reishi can actually Im improve coronary artery flow. It lowers cholesterol. It can help our our lungs actually have more oxygen capacity, which living in the times that we live right now, that seems really important. You know, one of its sort of traditional indications was shortness of breath. And, and in Chinese medicine, the lungs are, um, they're very associated with grief. So we often think of the heart of, as associated with grief in the Western world, but from a Chinese medicine perspective, grief is housed in the lungs. And so it's something that I, I ask myself when I tend to have respiratory illnesses come up, which I tend to be prone to, um, is asking myself, like, what, what grief am I processing? What grief am I holding here? What, what grief am I trying to release? And so it is used for things like you know, asthma and, um, allergies and, and stuff like that. But if we look at it from this Chinese perspective, we see that this this effect on our, our heart and our lungs is is really multidimensional. So there's even more I can talk about with um, the properties of, of reishi and, and what we know of in the Western world. But I want to just take a moment and shift into talking about reishi's affinity for our hearts, because this is really what it comes down to for why I love this. this um, mushrooms so much and and why I think it's so powerful for this time. So in Chinese medicine, reishi is considered to be something that helps nourishes our heart so our shen can settle. So shen from a, a Chinese perspective, to just to simplify it a little bit, shen is almost like this concept of um, the soul and, and the spirit and the soul. So we have a big Shen, like a capital S. That's like the light that we come from. And then we have our little Shen that lives inside of our heart, almost like our individual soul individuating from spirit and coming to live inside of our bodies. And so from a Chinese medical perspective, when we when the Shen, our soul, is, is disrupted, when it's not settled inside of our hearts, we can have what's called you know Shen disorders, which looks like things like mood disorders, anxiety disorders, irritability, insomnia, restlessness. I look at all this and I think, okay, we are suffering from Shen disturbance en masse in this world. Basically like all these things that we list as, a, as Shen disturbance um, is something that most people I know, myself included, experience. And so the, the concept here is that Reishi actually helps nourish our heart so much that it expands our Shen. It allows this, this individual light that is us, that came here in this lifetime to ignite the body and, and bring our soul to life, that it helps that part of us feel safe here, feel, feel grounded here. And, you know, we know, looking at trauma and what we understand about trauma, 
that part of what happens is we disconnect from our body. Right? We lift up and out that, that it doesn't feel safe to be here, so we pop out, which is a really um, smart mechanism to deal with a charge that's too intense to experience in that moment. And yet I think that the task of our lifetime here on the planet right now is to come back into embodiment to get that Shen settled again inside of ourselves so that we can be here for this journey. We can be embodied in, in full heart and soul. And, you know, it, it's something that I, I've thought a lot about, but, you know, if we want to return to a world where we can recognize the Shen of every being that we come across, the Shen of other humans, the Shen of the plants that we interact with, the, the earth itself, then we need to feel embodied in our own shen to have that that settledness come back in. And so, you know, it's to me, it's not surprising that one of the qualities that I have really found with Reishi that I don't see a lot of other people talking about, but it, it feels very clear to me is that Reishi has this, this subtle psychedelic quality to it. So we're all familiar with like the big psychedelics, you know, like the super mind altering ethnogens out there. But Reishi really has this subtle, subtle psychedelia to it. And, you know, most of the, the bulk of Reishi's medicinal constituents are best extracted in water, which is why, along with this podcast, I have a recipe for these like amazingly decadent uh, rapey ma Reishi maple cacao truffles that are like just they're they're kind of kind of out of this world and they will expand your perception and, and give you this experience of the subtle psychedelic but you know to to me the the heart is in in many traditions this organ of perception and if we want to see the the life force of this world if we want to be able to connect to plants on a heart to heart level and to have these experiences of this expanded perception of reality then we need to come back into our hearts which is exactly what reishi does and so I remember when I started teaching for the chestnut school, one time I went in to teach a class and I had made this reishi tea from fresh reishi I had just harvested. And I, I showed up and was just like, ooh, <laughs> I just was like feeling really good. Um, you know, reishi is, it's very calming. It is considered a nervine, so it does relax the nervous system. But, but I got there and um, Juliet, the head of the school, was like, if I didn't know any better, I'd think that you were high. And I was like, I am on Reishi. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do think that this this coming back into into our hearts, it's it's healing for for ourselves and it's healing for the world in, in so many in so many ways. And so here's the story that I wanted to share um, to sort of bring this all home and and why beyond its medicinal benefits, which are, of course are many, it's a panacea and I, it's one I, I take year long and I especially concentrate on, on taking in the winter time because as I said, I'm, I'm very susceptible to, to um, lung stuff and respiratory infections and things like that. But this, this story um, sort of catapulted reishi from being something I, I admired as a medicine and I had cool experiences with to really sort of internalizing as, okay, this is actually a profound medicine for this time. So I, um, where I live, um, we have a, a species of reishi called Ganoderma suge. So the species of reishi that you see most often talked about is Ganoderma lucidum. And that's the, the species that exists in, in China. There are several species around the world. But the, the one that grows here where I live is, is Ganoderma suge. And what's interesting about this mushroom is it only grows on hemlock trees. So if you were to ask somebody from these mountains a hundred years ago, what the keystone trees were of these mountains, they would say two things, chestnuts and hemlocks. And within the past 100 years, we have had um, blights come in for both of these trees. So there's the, there is the blight for the chestnut tree, which um, arrived to these mountains in the early part of the century and decimated the chestnut population. And then in the 80s, we had the woolly adelgid, this small insect that is non-native that has made its way to this continent and down into these forests that um, slowly kills the hemlock trees. And so what's fascinating is that our forests here have completely changed in the past 100 years. And even since the 80s, we've had, you know, 70 to 80% of the hemlocks in our forest fall. 
And as the hemlocks fall, the reishis bloom. So we now have whole swaths of forest where what was once hemlock forests now are forests of this mushroom. And there was one time where I was going to harvest this mushroom. I normally go out early in the season to scope out the spot. The reishis tend to bud out in early spring and they have these sort of white heads that, that push out of the tree. I, I think they look like kind of like cute little aliens, <laughs> but they, they push out and, and um, they're actually edible, the, the, the white nubs as they push out. So that, that's something you can do is sort of slice off the, the, the tips and they'll continue to grow um, and fry them up in the early spring. But what you're really waiting for is for them to reach their, their full maturation. Uh, normally here, that's around the summer solstice. And so they, they fan out in, in this sort of a gorgeous sepia toned from from dark red to to yellow lacquered um, shelf like a like a um, a seashell shelf sticking out and it looks a bit like yeah like you would imagine like a Chinese lacquered cabinet like just this this deep shine to it and so you can sort of see them shining in the woods almost like they're lanterns at a distance and and I had scoped out the spot earlier in the season and and I thought okay I'm going to go back to this spot because it was a really magical spot it was this tree that was growing over two boulders perched in the middle of this creek so this waterfall was rushing out from beneath the tree and it felt like this gateway to the other world mm -hmm. and right before I left to go back to visit this tree you know my with my harvesting knife in hand and my bags a friend called me and we were talking for a while she's a friend I've had forever and so there's a lot of comfortability so I kind of was letting my mind wander in and out of the conversation and finally we sort of reached the natural end of, of our talk and she asked me sort of offhandedly oh where are you headed to today and it was sort of in this space of sort of unthinking naturalness that I just said oh I'm going to visit a reishi tree and this friend of mine doesn't know anything about plants so she was like that's cool have fun bye and I get off the phone and I'm just standing there like, reishi tree? Like, why did I say that? Like, there's no such thing as a reishi tree. There's hemlocks and there's reishis. And I remember driving in kind of this like altered state thinking like, okay, why did I say that? And why did it feel so important? And why am I having like this sort of emotional experience with this word right now? And I got to the forest and I was standing with this tree. And it was in that moment that I realized this tree was no longer a hemlock, but it was not just reishi. It was both at the same time. It had become a reishi tree. It was alchemizing what was dying into something new, something being born. And I realized in that moment that I am a, a reishi tree, that we all are reishi trees, that we, we've come here to this planet at this time to become like reishi trees for this world. That, you know, all of us have stories like this stories where you know the field that was behind our house got paved over and turned into a strip mall or the ecosystems that we love are really struggling or the tree that once defined our woods is now disappearing we all carry these these stories of um, death and endings that we're moving through right now and what reishi I think is here to teach us and this idea that we are reishi trees is that every ending is a new beginning and that we came here to be midwives for a new world. And this is something that, that mushrooms do innately. It's their Tao in the world is to turn what is dying and alchemizing that into new life, into, into new medicine, um, into new potential. And I think we as humans have the ability to be in that role. You know, we, of course, you know, over the years and, and especially, you know, the past full of centuries, we have been the cause of, of a lot of trouble and strife in this world. And I think that cause really comes down to our Shen disruption. Um, but the more we anchor in, back into our Shen and into our bodies and and into this connection with the earth, the more we we can connect back into why I think we're here as humans, which is our ability to actually be co-creative forces here on the planet to, to help bring in more medicine, create more diverse ecosystems, create more abundance. And, and reishi as this, as this mushroom that helps us fortify our systems, come back into health, come back into alignment with ourselves, helps us to realize that we are here to be those reishi trees to alchemize 
this legacy of what is waning and to create an, a new birth here on this planet. Hmm. Well, Asia, I'm so glad you shared that story. I feel like we just have to mention your book because um, Mirrors in the Earth, I've been reading this book for the past six weeks or so, and this is kind of how you end the book. Mm -hmm. um, story of reishi and the story of the reishi tree and it's such a powerful ending to a book that's so filled with hope and beauty and I'm um, I've been reading the book it, you know so I'm a reader and I read a lot of like fantasy fiction like dragons and you know witches and wizards I love it all and I, I'll read like books like easily a couple books a week this is not that book this book is like I treasured it. I savored it. I read it chapter by chapter, really thought about it. And each chapter was like my favorite chapter because I knew you were coming up on this interview. So I'd be like, oh, I'm going to tell Asia that my favorite chapter was the chapter that had the moon in it. Um, <laughs> and following the faces of the moon or, you know, I had kept like, and it was like the each chapter was now my new favorite chapter. And then the ending with the reishi tree in your beautiful descriptions of harvesting the reishi and so respectfully as well and just everything oh it was just such a beautiful end and I feel like it's a very special thing that you shared that with us today too um yeah it's such such a beautiful connection that you have with reishi and such a beautiful book and and on and on and on I also want to say that I'm very excited that I take reishi every day. If I wasn't before, I am now. <laughs> <laughs> the whole time, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's why. That's why. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's a couple of roads that I would love to just like circle back on. Um, one, I feel like we have to definitely circle back on the reishi maple truffles recipe, right? We can't gloss over that. <laughs> So everyone who wants to can get a copy of that recipe at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com in the show notes. But will you just kind of like tell us a little bit about this recipe and how it came to be and, and all of those fun things? So I concocted this recipe after I went and, and harvested reishis one day. And it was this, if, if anyone's ever visited Southern Appalachia, you know that we get these like big, thunderstorms, summer thunderstorms, like every afternoon throughout the summer. And they're kind of like, they cannot be dark and, and dramatic and like sweep through. And so it was on one of these afternoons where I had all this fresh reishi uh, that, that I was like, okay, it's this dark, like sort of magical um, thunderstormy afternoon. And I just want to whip up something really special. And so I ended up creating these truffles. They, they're, they're super decadent and they have cacao butter in it and, um, you know, powdered cacao. And, and I used fresh reishi cause that's what I had, but most of the time you're going to be working with dried reishi. So, you know, the, the recipe is, is for making with this with dried reishi. And you, you start by making a uh, a concoct or decoction, um, which is a sort of a long simmering of the mushrooms. And then you reduce that and then you add maple syrup in and then you reduce that. And it just makes this like, yeah, first of all, there's something about maple and reishi together. It just really works. And then you add the cacao in and it's like mind blown. There's something about these, these little balls that, that you will create that they have, they have this sort of potent dark magic quality to them and not dark magic in like a negative context like a it's midnight and I'm you know stirring the cauldron or it's midnight and I'm like you know reading this really magical book or studying this you know um, new discipline like I, I find that it has this amazing ability to kind of help me focus and concentrate while also like expanding my perception. I, I lived with a roommate at the time and we would often eat these and then have these like philosophical conversations like late into the night. Like you know, you know those conversations that you're like, oh my gosh, I'm just, I'm just, my cup is so full after this. Like, you know, just talking about like spirit and magic and possibility. And and so, yeah, all, all of these qualities to me are, are embedded in in these truffles. And they it does take a little bit of time to make. So it's, it's something I invite you to make if you have like a, a rainy afternoon or a stretch of time, but they can be frozen and stored for later. So then you have them and just even to just snack on one and just like see, you know, see what happens in your mind, see what you're, see how your heart's opening, what you're being drawn to, because I've had a lot of really amazing, like synchronistic things happen when I eat these, these truffles. It just 
seems like magic is afoot whenever I whip up a batch of these. Oh, I'm so excited to try them. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, for people who've never, you know, harvested reishi before or bought reishi, what tips do you have? Maybe especially for, you know, like buying it, you know, where can people find reishi for this recipe or if they want to make some other reishi potion? Yeah. So reishi is, is one that people have figured out how to cultivate. So it's a, it's a mushroom that I feel pretty good about, you know, recommending people use like there, there's, there's other, um, fungal medicines out there that are harder to to cultivate that you know you want to be more careful with but reishi in general what i tell folks is to look for growers like mountain rose herb is a, is a good company that will connect you with growers that cultivate reishi most of the time you're going to see uh, ganoderma lucidum if you're purchasing online which is great and everything that i mentioned all of those benefits um you know, all, all, all are normally coming from studies with Ganoderma lucidum. Um, you know, you can do research to find out if you have a species of reishi growing nearby you. Um, but I, I do recommend always, of course, you have to have a positive ID, but I do recommend just start working with it from, you know, a, a grower that you find and trust. Some people, like I know here where I live, we have a couple um, like local mushroom growers who have inoculated um, logs and so you can get them fresh and locally. So you might find out if you have like a local mushroom grower nearby you that might be cultivating reishi. So those are some some good resources. And some people um, will take reishi powdered which is kind of like a, a like a fast route to really working with reishi's medicine. So that's something I did want to mention for this recipe. Like I think the there's a magic to the decoction aspect of it. But if you're like, listen, like I, I've got like 10 minutes for magic and that's it. You could <laughs> skip that and just add reishi powder um, to these, to these balls. But um, yeah, that, so that is, that is another way to take it. And reishi is, it's, it's a good bit bitter. So I, I do recommend that, you know, especially if you're, you're sensitive to bitters or you have a sensitive palate to, to mix it with other things in a tea or like in these, these um, truffles because yes, it's, it's kind of a bitter mushroomy taste. Um, one tip that I will add that I learned from my own experience is don't buy whole reishi, mm. whole dried, whole dried <laughs> reishi. If they're fresh, you can slice them up. But um, I bought whole reishi, they're so pretty. It was so tempting. So I, I bought it and I should have brought it because I still have it. I use it as like a classroom <laughs> demo. It's like 15 <laughs> years old. I use a saw. I use like a hammer and nail. Didn't even dent it. So it's so tough once it's whole and dried. So yes, you're buying that's a really dried, good tip, Rosalie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> buying dried, you want to get it sliced. You can often find it sliced or powdered like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So yeah. If you want a beautiful whole mushroom that you have for like the rest of your life, then you can buy it whole, but it's, it's, it's whole, it's whole. So yeah. Right. yeah. Um, I think, do you have anything else to add about reishi before we move on? Uh, you know, I think that, that that's really all I wanted to, to share about reishi, you know, reishi has um, very few contraindications. Like the, the the only one that I'm I'm really aware of is the contraindication of um, using caution with blood thinners. Um, and if you have mushroom allergies, but it's one of those ones that I consider to be a very safe tonic. Um, so I would just say to, to people out there who are curious about it, that this is a, is a good one to dip your toes in like a powerful medicine um, that also has like a pretty high degree of safety. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I actually want to spend more time talking about your book. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so the writing in here is so incredible and which is part of why I savored it and didn't rush through it. There were paragraphs where I felt like I would like need a month to create this paragraph because it was just so beautiful. And, but it's just one paragraph amongst many beautiful paragraphs in this book. So I was just often just honestly in awe of your ability to express so much beauty and in such a wise way. And I'm just kind of curious, like how did writing show up in your life and how have, yeah, 
how, how did you how did you start writing? What is your writing practices? I'm curious. This is like my own personal question here. <laughs> yeah, so I I always loved writing. And you know, when I was little, I thought, oh, I'm gonna be a writer when I grow up. And and I, you know, in some ways I, I did become a writer because writing's a huge part of of what I do. You know, it's my it's my business, it's what I, I love. Uh, and yet I, I always knew I wanted to write a book like that was kind of always mm. on my heart. And so I actually started this book 10 years ago. <laughs> mm. So when you say, oh, this would take me a really long time to write that paragraph. I'm like, yes, it probably did take me a very long time to write that <laughs> paragraph. Um, <laughs> but so, yeah, 10 years ago, it's like I knew that there was a book that wanted to come through. Mm -hmm. I just I could feel it. Like I, I, the way I describe it in the book is it's like waking up to a cat sleeping on your chest and like this insistent feeling of like time to wake up, time, time to write this book. But I just didn't know what it was about. Mm -hmm. And so I would sit down and I would write out these stories. Like I, I collected those stories over a decade that exists in the book. Um, and I would write out the stories and I, and I just, I didn't know what the connecting thread was. And it really took me living out these stories and starting and discarding drafts before I realized it was probably about like five years before I realized what the central theme of the book was, which is this idea that self-compassion is something that the the living world and the plants are actively trying to teach us. That are, they're actively trying to help us to realize, to see ourselves in the mirror of the earth, not because the earth is a is an object that we project ourselves upon, but that the earth is like, I call it the parent mirror. It's reflecting back to us our goodness, our our belonging and, and who we truly are, because when we see who we are, when we can hold ourselves with compassion, then we can access the gifts that we, we came here to give as a part of, of as, as a part of the earth's creation. You know, we are one of the earth's creation. We, we, we were given birth to by this planet and we came here to bring a gift and we really only can bring that gift when we can see and recognize and appreciate ourselves. So, you know, it sort of took me going on that journey to realize what it was that I was here mm -hmm. to write. And then it was like, once I realized that, then I was like, okay, I have the overarching idea because I know that, you know, there's, there's two ways to go about a book. There's like the long way, and the short way, the short way is like, I come up with the outline, I know what the book's about, like, then I sit down and I plug away. Well, I went the long route. I was like, <laughs> I have no idea. I'm just writing this and writing that. And how does it all fit together? Mm -hmm. So once I kind of had the overarching realization, I was like, okay, I have all the stories. Now I have to sort of like, realize how they all fit together and how one leads into the other and, and sort of reconstruct my own journey. Mm -hmm. So I wrote, I sort of sort of sat down and and wrote the book over a series of years. So I remember the first year, my goal was just to write for one hour a day, five days a week. And then I think the second year, I was like, all right, we're going to do like, you know, whatever it was like. It, and I, spoiler alert, that first year, I did not write for an hour a day, five days a week. It was like probably like one hour a week. Um, and then the second year, I think I got more serious about that. And then, you know, I slowly worked my way up to, I think the, the final like half year that I was working on it, it was like three hours a day, five days a week. Um, and so it was a serious, it was a serious commitment. And I had a whole first draft of that book without my story in it at all, which if you read the book it will be very surprising because my story is like a huge part of the book. It's like part memoir in mm -hmm. some capacity. And so I had, I had, you know, I had written these about these moments of these realizations with these plants, but none of my own backstory. And I, so I shared the book with, with my writing buddy, um, another wonderful writer named Samantha Fay. And she was like, Asia, like, this is great. And the writing's beautiful. And the ideas are great. But like, where's your story? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, you're right. My story's not in there. And I think it's because I don't feel like my story's worthy. And so that was another layer of the process of releasing mm -hmm. self and realizing my own story was worthy. And so I went back in and I, and I wrote my story back into, into every chapter. And so, yeah, that was like another year <laughs> to do wow. that process. And, uh, you know, I, I'm very interested in, in the idea of writing other books and seeing what it would be like to go the other route of having, <laughs> having the idea beforehand and, and having an outline and, and plugging away at it. But for me, that was the journey I needed to go on to write this book. And I, and I think it comes through in the book, in the way in which the book has that quality of a journey to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So there's, 
you know, in some ways there's like 12 lyrical essays that in some ways stand apart, but within each of those essays, it's a braided essay where you're combining these different, like your story and then these other like bigger themes. And one thing that I really appreciate about adding, about having your story in there is just the way you shared it. And, you know, you shared about your first day at herb class, you shared about, you know, having these new friends that were kind of like the earth skills and you not knowing much about that. And, and just like the humility and vulnerability in sharing that it, it was like, it gave me permission to see the meaning of my own personal story and my own evolution. And so I really like, it was a story. It was a beautiful, you know, it's a beautiful memoir, but it was also like an opening for me too to like reflect in my own life. And then of course, at the end, there are exercises and practices to kind of bring things um, to ourselves as well. So I really appreciated that uh, in addition to, you know, the bigger themes and reading about your life too. Mm. Well, that that's just so meaningful. And I, I really couldn't ask for a higher compliment than just hearing that it, it, it's shown a, a, a light on your own journey and, and to see the, the goodness and the value in your own journey, because that's, you know, that's so much of what the book's about. So thank you so much for sharing that with me. Mm. Yeah. And another thing that I really loved about the book is I know both of us are big fans of Robin Wall Kimmer and in her book, Writing Sweetgrass, one of the most, one of the many poignant things she shares in that book and she talks about how she does a um, survey of environmental student, environmental studies students, and she asks them what are, and these are like, a, you know, they're in their advanced studies and ask them what are some positive examples of humans and nature, and they aren't able to answer, which is a very scary thing, right? And we need, you know, if like environmental studies students can't, like they only see negativity between humans and nature, that's uh, not that's not what we need right now. So I that is one of the you know one of those threads in braiding sweetgrass that has like really meant so much to me and thinking about what my own personal teaching is and what I have to offer. And I feel like in some ways like this book is almost like that the continuation of that thread in a very positive mm -hmm. light because there there is so much doom and gloom out there. It's so easy to be heartbroken and overwhelmed about um, the story of our earth right now and ecological hardships. And that is not what this book is about, nor is it about glossing things over and pretending that it doesn't exist, but you just have a lot of really beautiful stories and analogies and hope and beauty, which I think is what we need right now, not not the doom and gloom. I'm never a fan of that, but your book brought it through in such a beautiful way of, again, not dismissing anything, but really looking at things in a hopeful, different way. Yeah, well, I'm so glad that that came through because I, it's something that I, I feel like I learned from the earth, really, because, you know, I, I definitely, um, when I first started really connecting to the plants and, and to nature in, in a meaningful way, I felt like I was drowning in grief some days. Like it was just so much of it was just so hard to handle. The more you learn, the more it's like, oh, this is really hard, you know? Um, and I would feel that, but then I would go out into nature and I, and I would have a completely different experience. You know, mm -hmm. I would feel the living world reaching out to me and saying like, there's always hope. There's always possibility. We want you to nurture and safeguard your hope because, you know, we know that when we have hope, <laughs> that's when we access our creativity and our innovation and, you know, our, our ability to connect. And it's like, you know, it's important to, to sit with the, the grief and the heartache. That is an important part of the healing process. Um, and, they're like anyone who's experienced any kind of loss in their life, you know, that it doesn't mean that the, it doesn't mean that the grief disappears or that it's not there or that it, it disappears or that it's not important. It means that the, the grief, it becomes integrated into the wholeness of who you are. Um, as you open up to the new era that that grief is really asking you to explore and, and, um, be a part of. And, and that's where we're at, I think, as a world. And I think that's what the, the earth is trying to help us remember, that there is hope and that we're here to, to be a part of that rebirth. Hmm. Yeah, that really comes through in the book and it's such an important message for today, like you said. 
I think I have one more thing I just want to fangirl about. <laughs> I'm just realizing this has just been so much fun because it's like I got to read this beautiful book. I love the beautiful book. And now I just have like my own personal session with the author to um, both, you know, exude my enthusiasm and ask questions about. But one other thing that I just want to say I really appreciated in the book is that it's filled with so much beautiful imagery. Again, you know, I'd read paragraphs, the same paragraph over and over again, just to soak in that beauty. And one thing I really appreciated it is that you had all these metaphors that were not expected. Mm. You know, like, um, for example, in the chapter where you talk about the autumn and the fall and the letting go of leaves and kind of talking about that for ourselves and how we might let things go, which is kind of like cliche a bit. And that's not where even you went with it. It's like you explain that. And then you talk about marcescent trees, the trees that hold on to their leaves and and, you know, pulled this whole other, you know, way of thinking about things out from that experience. So I just, I really loved that. I loved the pinching back of the basil as related to boundaries. I realize that people don't know what I'm talking about, but you have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> there was just, there was like surprising things, you know, it wasn't just beautiful. Uh, it wasn't just hopeful. It was also like, it gave me pause to think about things in a new way. So I really appreciated that as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that so much. You know, I think just the more I spend time with plants and in nature, it's like the more I'm continually surprised by, you know, just the the, the messages and, and the metaphors. It's just an ongoing creative endeavor just to be engaged and in a relationship with this world. Mm. Well, we are all so lucky that you have captured that and shared it so beautifully with us in your beautiful book. And I know you have other offerings with the book. You have a, like a little um, nature writing course that's a part of it. Um, you have meditations. So there's, um, I definitely recommend picking up the book at your local bookstore enjoying it, savoring it, and then being sure to be in contact with you to all the other ways that they can keep enjoying um, these themes and the hope and the beauty that's there. Oh, well, thank you, Rosalie, so much. I mean, just I'm, this has been like food for my heart in so many ways. Thank you for everything that you shared about your experience with the book. It's so meaningful. Oh, well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I think I shared that before we started recording. So I just wanted to mention too that I read this book mostly outside. Um, this summer I took it out to my hammock and um, and just read it out there. And it, yeah, it's a whole experience which is very healing and very grounding. And uh, so I, I I highly recommend for those of you picking up the book. Um, and you also have an audiobook too, right? It's, it's also available yes. as audiobook. Yeah, the, the audiobook is on Audible and and other places, but I know Audible is where a lot of folks get their books. So it is there and it is narrated by me, which was really fun to do. Wonderful. Yeah. So I recommend wh however you pick it up, I'm um, just, you know, putting it out there. You might want to read it outside because that was especially beautiful <laughs> for me too. All right, Asia, to close, I have a season six question for you. So for everyone who listens to the podcast regularly, you know that I ask all the guests same question for each season. And I want to give a shout out to Laura and Anne Marie because I asked my readers, what question should I ask for season six? And they both came up with a variation of this question. And um, I feel like for you, Asia, this is like a question that you kind of like all of your work exudes this. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like the perfect question. Also, be Mothra might be like, we have already discussed a lot of it. But um, the question is, uh, herbs give us so much. And so how do you like to give back to the plants? Oh, okay, so there's so many things I want to say <laughs> about this because I feel like giving back is like something I'm just the gift giving aspect of it is something I'm really passionate about. But so I wanted to just highlight it like a couple things for sort of the different maybe kinds of people who listen to this or, you know, pa different passions. So first of all, I will say uh, on a very technical level, my partner um, recently has gotten really into um, regenerative agriculture and soil science. And I've been learning more from him about how important it is to re-inoculate your soil with um, fungal components and creating fungal dominated compost. And so he's the scientist behind it. I can't, I can't say that I have necessarily that kind of mind, 
But just on the topic of, of mushrooms, I, I've been learning so much about how how even if you just you know get this this fungal don dominated mushroom tea for example um, and put it back into the earth that it can recreate these mycelial connections and even though there's not as much topsoil or it's depleted it actually makes the nutrients more available in the soil for like all the plants that are there so I'm I'm really excited about that even though I'm not the, the science mastermind behind it so that's like a a very physical way of, of giving back. But I've always, I've always loved these more physical actions. So, you know, getting a glass of water and just taking a moment and holding it to your heart and thanking that plant and then pouring the glass of water at the roots. That's like a very tangible thing. <laughs> when I, when I lived um, in New York city uh, and, you know, was going through my, my monthly cycles, I would take my period pads and soak them in water and then use that water to feed my plants. And I remember, mm -hmm. I still have people who are like, oh yeah, that's the girl that told me to feed my period blood to plants, <laughs> which is really <laughs> funny. But it, you know, it was like, it was, it sort of killed two birds with this one stones and it was full of nutrients. So that's like, that's another thing. So those are some like really tangible things, but something I've been practicing a lot re recently um, that actually feels really good, especially because sometimes we feel like, okay, I, I don't have even water in this moment. Like, you know, what can I give is actually just connecting to a plant and in your mind's eye, imagining that plant like completely flourishing, like seeing that plant in like all of its beauty and glory and possibility. And so, you know, I'll, I'll do this, like, for example, there's, um, there's a mimosa tree that, um, is between my home and my office. And I made a flower essence from the flower one day sort of on the fly. So I didn't really have like a, a gift. Like I normally would bring like water or maybe like a stone or something like that. And I didn't really have a gift. I was like, I told that tree, I was like, every time I pass by, I'm going to say hi and I'm going to envision you as this big, beautiful tree. Um, and, and I've really found that even just this act of imagination of saying, I'm going to use my energy and my intention to envision this flourishing for you, um, that it's so appreciated by the living world. It's, it's like, um, yeah, it's its own kind of food. Like our, our, our attention and our imagination is something that we have in spades as humans. And I think it's very appreciated. So I know I went from like this sort of high tech thing to this very low tech thing, but I kind of just wanted to give people that to show that like, there's always a way to give back. And, and even if it's just sitting in your home and looking at the, the tree outside and just sort of beaming the, this um, intentions of, of love and flourishing that that can, that can do so much. And it is so received and appreciated by the living world. Hmm. Oh, that's so beautiful, Asia. And I did not foresee any of those, which is why I really love asking <laughs> people the same question, you know, the responses that I get to hear are wonderful. And yeah, I appreciate all of those. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's really been an honor and a delight to be here with you, Rosalie. Oh, I feel the same way. Thank you so much, Asia. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to Asia's Reishi Maple Truffles recipe card. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. You can also find Asia at onewillowapothecaries.com. If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so that you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. And I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview and this amazing mushroom. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.